Hey, Coach, the obvious question is, um, you know, the one we asked um, uh, Steph and, and Christian rolled on yesterday. I'm just, I'm just curious what you think about the reopening of the facilities and how that might get done and, and whether it'll be worth it with all the social distancing protocols you're still going to have. Well, I, I think from I, I could talk about that from two different perspectives. So number one, um, you know, from a mental standpoint, I think everybody has been cooped up for a long time and just getting out. And, you know, even if you're not, you know, close and however the arrangements come out with quadrants, segments, you know, all of the safety issues that we are going to do before we even step on the field. You know, I think it'll be good for the guys they run around on the grass. I, 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 I'm sure that they are going to want to do something. Now, the flip side of that, what I would tell you, Chris, is that, you know, if we start now, but games are still down on the horizon, well, guys are going to be tired of dribbling around cones for an hour a day. You know, that's not much fun for them either. So we're trying to keep both of those mindsets uh in, in our thoughts of how we roll out this training and, and what do we do? And, you know, more importantly, what are we allowed to do at the appropriate moments? But we're talking about all the different things and options. And, you know, from a, from a, from a medical standpoint, from a training standpoint, you know, guys can only do so much in their apartments and in, in their living rooms and the, the workouts on zoom and all of that. So, you know, our, our fitness guys are saying, hey, look, we got to get them outside and open their legs up, you know, get the hamstrings moving again. So there's a physical component. Then there's also a mental component to it as well. Brian, Michelle Mendoza here. How does the team in general and, and maybe some of the individuals, players feel about the uh, limitations? Are they anxious to just go back to play or is there some trepidation in uh, maybe contracting or spreading this virus? Michelle, I can't, I can't say for certain because I haven't pulled all of them. This is, this is such early, uh, early doors here. I mean, we haven't really explained the whole protocol because the protocol is not set yet. So there's a lot of hoops that we have to jump through first before we roll it out and present it to the players. And then I'd be able to give you some feedback as far as, you know, who's a little anxious, who's a little, you know, ah, it's okay, you know, we're outdoors. And, you know, I, I'm sure there's a mix of both. I mean, I would I would say that in in life and society and all of that, there's people, you know, that, that are a little bit more hey, let's just, let's go out there. It's, there's some risk. And then there's other people that are, you know, more along our lines that we want to be safe and we want to make sure that everything is okay. Uh, I got a question for Garth. Uh, Garth, I just, I wanted to know, Extreme. knowing your, uh, your experience and whatever you know in terms uh, of what the companies have had with the, players union uh, what's the likelihood that at some point there might have to be some uh economical cuts on on players ends uh nico those are conversations that take place from the league to the players union and we are not involved in those so i have no opinion and no idea hello coach salvador perez, salvador perez here uh yeah Asking you about the time of precision the South Sounders need uh, before the, the return to the competition. How much time does South Sounders need about that? Well, well in, a, in an ideal world, since there's been such a lengthy delay, we like to have, you know, six weeks. But what is that six weeks? We don't know if that's you know, a week of individual training, two weeks of individual training, I, 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 she's, block, it's too much. block of time for, you know, group, small group training. And then there has to be, you know, the government, the governors, our doctors, everybody has to give the okay for full team training before we get to the game. So I would, I would love to have 
something similar to what we do in preseason, but we'll be ready, you know, regardless of, of how it shapes up and what it looks like. Mr. Garth, uh, asking you about, about, the, about the next games, so the next games so of South Sanders uh, on, the, on, the, on the season, on the season. If the MLS decides to get closed doors for the games about that, about the coronavirus, which can be the position of all Sanders about that, about playing games with closed doors? You're muted, Garth. Thank you, my man, Nico. Um, what I was saying, unfortunately, is not much different than my answer to Nico, which is that you know those are decisions that will get made on a league level uh, and, and will get made uh, by the Board of Governors. And, you know, we will execute, you know, what the league collectively decides in, in that regard. So this is Jada with the uh, Seattle Times. Brian, he, with the changes or the announcement as far as the training goes, has that given you more to do uh, lately or what have your days been like in terms of soccer related work? Yeah, it gave us a little bit of, you know, a little bit of smile on our face, thinking that we could actually start to even think about planning training. Um, but again, I'll go back to the earlier point. If these individual trainings are going to start when it's safe, when it's been okayed by all parties that need to be, that need to bless this, it's really, it's one soccer player in a quadrant of a field and there's really not much you can do. I mean, we, we talked about, you know, the first week, just let's just get them out there. We talked about the second week of individual training. Maybe we can make some competitive, you know, games where they're, you know, working against each other and their specific quadrants according to a stopwatch. We were trying to think of fun ways to get them to, you know, interact with each other, but not interacting with each other, if that makes sense. Hey, Garth, Jackson here. Uh, you know, usually at the start of May, we're really talking a lot about the transfer window opening up and things, action starting to happen. Have you been in any conversations about the changing of the windows this year and how those windows may change going forward? And, and how are you even supposed to work right now in terms of, of, of a theoretical window opening up? Good question, Jackson. And, and I think it's going to be, uh, the good news is, is I think there's going to be a lot of flexibility. So uh, FIFA broadly has expressed, uh, you know, not just MLS, but to, to many leagues that, you know, they will work with us and try to be accommodating uh, as to, you know, when the league can resume play. So, but as a starting point, we have, we have to figure out uh, if we can safely resume play. I think once we know that, then you can look at transfer windows. But even then, um, as you guys know, right now, there's an immigration ban uh, uh, in the United States and, and players couldn't get visas. Uh, even if uh, you wanted to bring them in. So right now we're just at a total shutdown uh, from a player acquisition standpoint. Garth, Michelle Mendoza again. Um, what do you think, what is some of the conversation about the fan experience once the stadiums open again? Is Has there been conversation? And uh, what do you think it could look like, some of those changes? You know, Michelle, we're going to be guided by what the public health authorities tell us uh, is feasible. Uh, and so, and again, I apologize for, for sounding like a broken record, but uh, I think it's really important that we uh, not take any positions here. You know, we, we can have ideas and, and we can discuss those, uh, but ultimately those decisions will be driven by the public health authorities on, on both the state uh, and, and county level. So, uh, you know, whatever they tell us uh, is safe, uh, we, will, we will work with, we will try to implement. Um, you know, but most important for us is just to try to safely get back to a point where we can we can play soccer in front of fans again, just because that's a lot of fun. And hopefully we can be uh, a real unifier in the community, both in uh, implementing uh, the, the stay at home orders in place right now and being good citizens and, and protecting our, our, our fans and our staff and our players. Uh, and then if we can get through this uh, as a unifier of our community to bring everybody back, everyone back together again. It's sort of on that note, Garth and Brian, uh, this is Aaron Levine. Um, I know it's a league decision and it's also going to come up to the, the health authorities as well. But ECS, Emerald City supporters, came out with that uh, statement that they're fir firmly against potential for closed door matches or neutral site matches. 
I know their main concern was the health of the players, but they also said soccer without fans is nothing. Wanted to get your reaction, either one of you reaction on that. You want me to go, Garth? Yeah, you're the ECF member. I feel, I, I yeah. feel like you might be better qualified than me. Yeah. Well, look, it, it, I w- what I would say, Aaron, is this. It, nobody wants to play games. Fans, players, owners, uh, TV, it, nobody wants to play them with, without any fans. I mean, the games are so much better. The atmosphere at CenturyLink is awesome. It, it, it's such a great feeling to walk out there, you know, it, it, walking out there on November of last year was one of the most unbelievable experiences of my life. So we obviously don't want that to happen. Now, again, I'll echo Garth a little bit here. A lot of those decisions are way above my pay grade. I'm really I'm glad that ECS is thinking about the health of the players, because I think that's, you know, the health of all of us, not just the players, but the people as well. I think that should come first. But then, you know, we hope that, you know, by some miracle, somebody finds a vaccine or, you know, something good happens and we're able to control this this terrible disease and we can get back to normal. Until then, we'll just keep doing like Gar says. We'll be good citizens. We'll we'll try and provide a leadership role as 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 stewards of the city and the club. And when when the time comes and somebody tells us, okay, you're gonna go over here to play, we'll be ready. Coach Michelle Ledka from Q13 here now. First off, thank you for not wanting to start this call until I got on it. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> secondly, um, some of the players were telling us about the trivia night that the team has now orchestrated in, re- in um, addition to their group workouts that you guys have been able to do over Zoom. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the trivia night, how that came to be, and how important during this time finding ways to have team camaraderie is. Okay, so there's there's a couple of things there, uh, <clears throat> Michelle. Number one, uh, we had it a couple of nights because only a couple nights because there was some there were some issues. There actually is a website out there that you can go online and it it puts the questions up there has a timer. I forget the name of it, but we were able to you know do it a couple nights. The coaching staff uh, won the first night. And then Danny Leva's team won the second night. And there were some issues with, you know, some of the guys didn't know all the questions, like the Spanish speakers couldn't understand everything. And then the captain of the team had to answer most of the questions. I mean, we were feverishly texting the answers. And, you know, I'm sure there was cheating going on. People were on their phones trying to find the answer. So it got to be a little bit of a disaster. So we started something else because we have Yaimar Andrade, you know, I know they're uh, Shane O'Neill and, and even getting to know their, the teammates a little bit better. We've switched up trivia night to get to know your sounder teammate. And we had Jimmy Traore start us off. We had Yaimar, we had Will Bruin and Zakawan, Steve Zakawani and, and Brad Evans hosted the event. We were all on there. And those guys were interviewing Yaimar, you know, what was life growing up in art in Colombia and how is he playing and how does he like Seattle? So that was a little bit easier to manage. And the players were able to ask their own teammates questions. And so it got them interacting again without, you know, being next to each other. So that's our latest and greatest. It's just a way, Michelle, just to have one more touch point during the week other than our Zoom workouts. And, it, and it's been good. Garth, Jonathan Tannenwald out here, the Philadelphia Inquirer. Hope everything is going well out there. Um, Think about, you know, the, the benefit that would come to MLS as a whole, not just in Seattle, but obviously in cities like out here where the team is not as popular, if MLS was able to get back on the field for some of the other American sports leagues. And it seems like the league has been pretty disciplined in not trying to rush back and not trying to sort of win any sort of race against other sports, you know, to be back first and the benefits from TV ratings and such that would that would accrue from that. What's your perspective on that and and, you know, what the benefit or or not benefit would be in Seattle in particular and also given your experience league wide? You're muted again. Sorry. Yeah, I gotta gotta get better at this stuff. 
Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Jonathan. Thanks for uh, joining us all the way from Philadelphia out there. I hope I hope folks out there are doing okay. Um, you know, I think it's important to have a long term view in, in response to your question. And, you know, I, I think, you know, would you get uh, some likes and some hits and some eyeballs? I mean, the, we're, how many guys on this call are going to watch the Korean baseball game uh, today? Because the, they're, they're starting an open day right in front of empty stadium. So, you know, you, your point is valid, you know, that you're going to get uh, whoever's first is going to get an uptick. But I, I honestly think that lasts for a week or a day or a news cycle. Um, and I think it's far more important to take the long term view and, and have the, the best interests of your players, your fans and your staff. Uh, at heart, and you know that's that's what we're going to do, and I think that's why there's maybe not a race uh, in terms of uh, coming back for MLS. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a weird sports season no matter what. Um, you know, we're all you know at home watching the Last Dance. At least those of you who've ever uh, watched basketball or lived in Chicago like me, uh, it's the greatest sports documentary of all time. Uh, it'll you'll never ever get footage like that ever again. Um, in a modern world of social media. So if you're not watching it, you should be. Um, but like, we're all craving that, right? Because there aren't live sports. And, you know, the NFL draft has record numbers. There's no live sports. So, so Jonathan, your, your, your point's completely valid. Um, but I don't think, that, you know, there really is a fix to that other than, you know, come back when it's safe uh, and in a manner such that you can keep playing. Because I think it'd be far worse if we rushed back and then had to shut down again. And then people didn't trust us. And, um, weren't sure about coming back to the stadium. I think that that could be a real disaster. So, um, you know, I think it's a it's a it's a tortoise uh, proposition. The slow and steady, uh, hopefully, wins the race. If I could follow up real quick, um, are you guys qualified to get back on the field tomorrow? Because by way of example, I believe the union here are not because the county is still would still force them to stay at home. Yeah, and and, I, and I, I've been explaining to some of the local guys, but but no, we we are not training tomorrow, Jonathan. And and, and MLS didn't intend, I, I don't think, for everybody to act like they were going to come back. It was always going to be the local uh, public health authorities that were going to drive that. So MLS is tasked with a kind of base case of like, if you do all these things, you could come back. But they are very, very clear, at least in their internal stuff with us, to say, if you have the authority the local health authorities and um so you know we will have those conversations uh, with our local folks but we definitely will not be training tomorrow thank you Regard that hey, so guys, um, regarding the last dance uh what does that kind of bring back um as far as memories for you and you know what have you really enjoyed the most i mean you obviously you mentioned the the footage that we've we've never seen but um yeah what have you kind of enjoyed the most being a being a native well, first of all, I mean, it's it's an urban legend. And, and by the way, for those who don't want to go in these weeds with, with me and Jada, I totally understand. So I'll, I'll keep it brief. But uh, as a Chicago native, uh, you know, this really is the thing that was the most important probably in my boyhood other than maybe Walter Payton. Um, you know, and it, it's absolutely amazing to see what they the, what they were able to capture. And, and it's the stuff of legend because for 20 years, this sat in a vault. Like everybody, at least in Chicago, you knew it was out there. You knew that they had this, but that no one would let it come out. I mean, it was more infamous maybe than Al Capone's vault in Chicago. And now to have it come out in this fashion and be just this spectacular, Jada, is, you know, you know, little things like the triple block on Charles Smith uh, to go to the finals. I think it was in, in uh, well, I can't remember which one it was, but, you know, to watch that sequence where a layup and the Bulls lose – and they may lose the series, and you get uh, Pippen, Grant, and Jordan in succession blocking layups to win the game. I mean, little things like that to the you know to the grand stories they're telling. And you know, again, as a kid who grew up watching it, it, it uh, all the stories are things you remember pieces of. So it it's been uh, appointment viewing for me. Garth, you Garth. Know, I just one um, thing uh, regarding playing without fans. I mean. The mayor um, said that she doesn't expect that uh, for a long time here, uh, but mentioned mannequins. I just wanted to get both of y'all's opinion as far as having mannequins in the stands, um, what that would do or not do for y'all. You know, I'll let Brian talk about the, you know, the players and coaches' perspective. You know, I, I think yeah, he's, I think Brian said this pretty eloquently already, though. You know, we. We'd all love to get to a point where we can play in front of fans because that's our home field advantage and that's what's the most fun. Yeah. And Mr. I just want to go Mr. Garth? Mr. Garth? 
I wait a second, to... guys. Wait, wait a second. Let's let Brian finish his thought, please. Oh, we'll sure. next question. Sorry. Brian, go ahead. Look, I just want to go on the record that Garth and Meyer's relationship is better than Phil Jackson and Jerry Krause. <laughs> Thanks, go. Brian. Appreciate yeah. that. <clears throat> yeah, Brian, Mr. Garth. You, Brian, you done there with your remarks? Just want to make sure. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Salvador. Mr. Garth, uh, asking you about about the about the plan. Uh, from Mexico and USA uh, about Enrique Bonilla and Dorian Garber and that idea of having a North American league with Liga MX and MLS. Which are your thoughts about that? I think it sounds amazing. Uh, you know, again, this is, uh, I read uh, Mr. Iragori's comments with interest. Uh, I think the, the leagues have obviously taken some steps to work together. Um, you know, we're slated to play in the Campeones Cup uh, in August in Seattle. Uh, and the Leagues Cup uh, was has been formulated, you know, as a comp meaningful competition between the leagues. And, um, you know, you know, unfortunately, we just got knocked out of the Champions League a couple of months ago. Uh, but that's a tournament that's been of importance to the Seattle Sounders throughout their history. Uh, and that competition uh, against teams from all over CONCACAF, but against Mexican teams specifically, uh, has generated great interest in our fan base and I think our whole region. Um, and it's something that, that makes me excited. Uh, you know, the Mexican League's an unbelievable league uh, and really, really high level of competition. And I think playing against uh, th that league and those players and those coaches will only make us better. There can, there can be an increase of marketing of merchandising of economical with the fusion of the Mexican League and the MLS. That can be? Uh, my guess is that we're not going to do it unless it makes some people money, right? Uh, you know, no one's going to do it with the idea of, of those things declining. So, but look, I mean, without, you know, not to be flippant, but, you know, it's a, it's a larger market, right? I mean, you're talking about selling uh, uh, English and Spanish language rights in three different countries, right? Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Um, and, you know, hopefully that would open up a, a really, really large marketplace relative to the world. Uh, and, you know, I think, again, could create opportunities for, for both leagues. Hey, Garth, you. now that you're touching the subject of Liga MX, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Liga MX uh, deciding to no longer do relegation for the next six years? And did that surprise you at all? I, I actually, Nico, have no knowledge of, you know, internal Mexican politics. So, I, I, you know, I don't know what drove it or why they did it. But I do know that it does align itself more with, MLS, um, you know, which also doesn't have promotion and relegation. Uh, and so, you know, it is one of these issues that would have to be managed if you ever had any kind of, you know, more extensive joint competition. And, you know, with that, you know, with the relegation being suspended, at least uh, temporarily, um, it's one last issue that uh, we would have to tackle. Hey, Coach, um, I have a question. It's Jose Rodriguez from Deporte Total. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the schedule for the rest of the year. There's talk about 32 games for a while now. Do you see that as, a, uh, that as a possibility? Would you like to see your team play 32 games? Uh, thinking about, you know, the players playing maybe Sunday, Wednesday, and then back again on Sunday. As a coach, what is your opinion on that? Thank you. Well, as a coach and as a fan, I'd like to have as many games as possible, but also with the safety of the players, and the quality of the matches, that has to have some input into the discussion. I mean, if you have, you know, a bunch of games in a compressed amount of times and all of your star players are injured or they're tired or something, then nobody's going to come and watch the games. So, you know, this is a, obviously a very, very fluid situation. We don't know when, when we're going to be able to go back and play. And again, those were just my personal feelings, but people that are much smarter than I am will be making those decisions, and I'm sure they will take into consideration player safety and quality of the matches, because I think both of those are very big topics. Hey, Garth, it's, it's Tim Booth from the AP. Got two quick questions for you. Um, first, is it your understanding that you guys will not be able to have individual trainings until the the stay at home order expires at the end of the month, or do you believe you'll be able to have those before that, before May 31st? Uh, this is critically important, Tim. 
it's really important. I have no opinion on this. We have no opinion on this. We'll do as we are directed by the public health authorities. So, uh, you know, if they say that, you know, they deem individual training as compliant with the offer, with the order, excuse me, then we'll do it. And if they don't, we won't. Okay. And the other the other question, based around what the governor has laid out about the sort of the steps along the way, has there been, and, and the timeline that MLS has laid out of a potential moratorium being lifted and, and the target date for return to play, has there been any conversation about the team when it comes to having a, a second training camp, potentially having to go out of market to a locale that has lifted some of those restrictions to be able to have a group of 25 or or 40 people together to have your second training camp essentially you know that's a really good question tim and and i think everything's on the table you know if we get to a point where uh it's a judge that we can safely play matches as a league uh then i think we'll do whatever we can to try to best prepare our team for that eventuality you know and i, I think there are just so many plans out there but you know whether it's you know central location a couple locations markets with no fans that like all of these things are on the table and they all have different solutions and they've all been game planned um so it's it's just it's impossible to give a really intelligent answer as to what we would do until we understand when we play uh and how we're playing and then we'll we'll react accordingly thank you i have a question for brian this is femi abebefe with como news here in seattle uh, do you think this has been tougher for you guys as a league, the fact that you went through an entire training camp and now you started a season where you able to get two matches under your belt and then were taken off the field, unlike a league like Major League Baseball, who was only able to go through maybe a few spring training games and hasn't started their regular season? I think it's, I think it's more challenging for sure. Um, you, we did a good job of preparing for you know, the, the season uh, we were down in Mexico at the Mexican national team facility. It was a great experience for us. A lot of team bonding, lots of good training. And then we played two games and, you know, then we got to reset. So it's mental and it's physical. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a greater challenge than someone that just pushes back spring training. I think that's pretty much, uh, you know, you, you set it back. Obviously, the baseball players have to keep in shape as well. I mean, they have to do whatever they can do in this time of quarantine. But, you know, I think it's definitely harder if you've started and then you got to go again. And, you know, to Gar's point earlier, I think it would be even 10 times worse if we started, shut down, started again, and then had to shut down a second time. I think that'd be catastrophic. And to follow up, just as competitors, I know obviously we all want to stay healthy and stuff, but as competitors, the last time we saw you guys on the field, you were hanging a banner, defending champions or cup title champions. How frustrating has it been not being able to defend that cup title and really going for a supporter's shield uh, this season with CONCACAF being uh, off the table? Yeah, it, it, it certainly hurts. Uh, thank you for bringing up the CONCACAF Champions League. Thank you for that. Um, let's try to get away from that without having to talk about it. But yeah, that was bitterly disappointing. Um, being able to go after a supporter shield, uh, this club has always gone after all trophies, whether it's Cascadia Cup, Open Cup, MLS Cup, CCL. I mean, we always want to win games. That's just ingrained in the in the Sounders organization. We're going to be competitive in every match. Uh, you take that a layer down. I mean. Uh, the coaches, I mean, they were all excited. We were, you know, thrilled about winning MLS Cup and we had all these plans and the, these programs and, you know, we were uh, renewing our push to do the youth initiatives. We were getting together a little closer with all the academy guys and then, you know, one layer below that. I mean, new players like Jao Paulo, who wanted to come to Seattle, Andrade, uh, Yaimar, wanting to come here and prove to the coaches, the fans, the team, his, their teammates, that they can be contributors on this team. I mean, there's a lot of layers to that question. Thanks, Brian. Hey, Brian, uh, this is Maz Vida. Just what's been the message to the players in terms of balancing the competition and everything you just talked about on Femi's question, and also balancing the families? Because some of the players have families that are far away. 
And what's that been like for you to get them, keep them engaged? Uh, well, it's been tough. I mean, we check in with them once a week. I have all my assistants call out to them, reach out to them, make sure that everybody's okay. They all have separate groups that they talk to. You know, I've reached out to a couple guys uh, personally myself, but it's it's been tough for some of the guys uh, being cooped up in a in an apartment. You know, their families at home. You know, you you've heard some of the reports coming out of Ecuador. You know, when is COVID really gonna you know, hit Argentina, other places where we have players coming from, Mexico, you know, all the reports you see daily. I mean, we've tried to tell them to be smart. I mean, sometimes it's okay to turn the TV off, you know, turn your Twitter feed off because it seems like that's that's always bad news. Um, but it's it's been challenging. Our Our objective is always to just say, hey, how can we help? Is there anything you need? and then try and fulfill that as best we can. Hey, Garth, Brian just got a, brought in a bit interesting point about how the coronavirus hasn't hit some parts of the globe yet. And as you look at the contracts of your current players and kind of what's expiring and kind of what you have to rework, do you foresee you know, how the club may look a year or two from now and say, okay, we need to kind of keep the squad same because we may not be able to bring in certain guys from certain parts of the world because – you know, the virus may still be shutting down other places compared to where it is affecting here. Yeah, Jackson, that, that's definitely a concern. I mean, it has been a bizarre year. I mean, you guys had to listen to me all off season saying, you know, we can't do anything because we don't have a CBA and we can't make long-term commitments. And then we got through that for about, and I think three or four weeks after that, then we shut everything down again and said, you know, we're back to not knowing anything, right? Not knowing when we're going to play, I mean, again, FIFA has indicated there'll be some flexibility with contracts, but, you know, we literally don't know today when contracts end. Um, you know, we don't know what our season looks like. So there's just, you know, we don't know when we're going to be able to sign players again. So it's just one of these where, again, you, you got to kind of try to imagine any possible scenario. But, um, you know, I go so far as to say, I mean, we, we haven't even seen our team play together. Um, when we played in Champions League, you know, Nico Ladero hasn't set foot on the field for us. You know, he's our captain and our best player. So, um, you know, we have to get our guys out on the field and, and see how we do. And, you know, then we can start to make evaluations and decisions, you know. But as you guys know, the, the one positive for us is, you know, going all in for Champions League, you know, we've largely deployed our resources for this year. You know, so, you know, I don't, we don't have the ability to make major changes in the club, um, you know, because we spent all our money up front. Uh, and again, it didn't work out. That's the way it goes. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the part of the cycle we're in right now. Uh, Garth and Brian, I had a question about uh, kind of youth development. Uh, wh at what time or how long is it before you kind of get concerned about how the youth players are going uh, through this whole process, you know, uh, their development. Obviously, you've got a bunch of players down at Defiance who are expecting to get a bunch of game time this year to develop. So I'm just curious how, how this kind of affects uh, the development at the uh, youth stage. Look, look, it, it, it obviously puts it on hold, right? I mean, for all the reasons that Brian's articulated for our first team, those are equally frustrating for our, our second, second team in our academy. Um, our staff uh, has been amazing. You know, they've, they've done everything from, uh, you know, instruction, you know, in videos and literally on ball manipulation and drills and Zoom calls and tactics. And uh, Brian's been really generous with his staff and their time. And they, those guys have done AMAs with uh, some of the academy kids. And we've done a lot of work uh, as a club on the soccer side to really unify uh, that player pathway, you know, and to, to get everybody together from a development perspective. Uh, and again, a, a, a hat tip to, to Brian and his staff. I think they've been really open to it. Uh, and in a lot of ways, the one thing that all this time has gotten us, Mickey, was just a little bit more time to get to know each other and to appreciate, you know, there's a series of, you know, seven or eight presentations from the development staff uh, to the first team staff to, to kind of more deeply explain and embrace, you know, how it is that we prepare these players and try to get them ready to to get up to the first team. And, uh, you know, as you guys know, we, we hired John Hutchinson in the offseason as a full-time development coach to try to help uh, push these kids along the pathway. So I think long-term, there's a bunch of really exciting things going on. Uh, and, you know, in the short term, again, we're all just trying to get through this and, again, try to be responsible citizens. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's a bummer. Kids are inside, but 
you know, that means that people stay alive, then, you know, we're going to do that. Coach, from last word on soccer, um, just uh, there's a there's been a lot of charity work uh, done by the players. You know, Stefan, um, Christian rolled in yesterday where uh, we're chatting about how they've done like live streams with video games and, and whatnot. Just what is how does that make you feel like being the coach of these players, seeing them do all this charity work and raising all this money to help for COVID-19 efforts? Well, it obviously makes me proud to be part of an organization that does a lot in the community. And I think that's been one of the calling cards since the 70s. You know, there was a lot of guys even back then that would go out and do appearances, uh, help the communities in any way they could. That tradition has gone on now and it and it continues to be better with more opportunities. These the pro athletes these days have many, many more opportunities with social media events. You know, a lot of them, Jordan Morris has his own foundation. I mean, there's really a lot of good that can come out of uh, pro athletes helping out their their communities. Um, for me, what Steph does, what Christian does, those are all the, you know, kind of the high pro, what Jordan does, the high profile things. There's also some of the lower profile things. When we were down at Starfire and, you know, we're walking out to practice on a Saturday night or excuse me, Saturday morning out to practice and there's other kids around and parents are out there, you know, a lot of the players stop and just say hello. They wave and, you know, even that can make a world of difference to, to kids and their parents. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, Nico Ladero said hi to me or, you know. Uh, Roman Torres said hi to me or Clint Dempsey or, you know, Zach Scott. I mean, we've had so many good big name players. Obafemi Martins would say hi to me. I mean, those are those are those are life moments for some of these kids. Garth, um, I don't want to get anybody in trouble with the ECS to be sure, but I'm thinking about, you know, their desire. And they're certainly far from alone to not have games without fans of if that's possible. And I wonder if the the collective strength of MLS, and maybe this could be applied to the USL and, and some of the other American soccer leagues too, if that helps, if the time comes and if there's no vaccine, and obviously this is one of a million ideas, but if we're really all playing games behind closed doors for a year plus all the way across the country, does the collective strength of MLS compared to the Premier League, which is sort of, you know, 20 teams without a commissioner in the way that you have in, in American sports. Does that collectiveness help at a moment like that? I, I think the, for sure the fact that the MLS owners are collectively invested in the enterprise, I think, helps a lot. I think it gives the league, I mean, above all else, it <clears throat> gives the league real financial strength. Um, and I think, it, you know, if you look at what the world might look like at the end of this, um, you know, certainly we are going to feel the impacts of it just like the rest of the world. Uh, but hopefully uh, MLS will come strong on the other side, and perhaps even stronger relative to some of the other leagues or some of the other clubs around the world that have to be a little bit more self-reliant. You know, and there's even some big clubs out there that uh, are have to be pretty self-reliant in these really adverse circumstances. So um, that is something that could be an opportunity. Uh, but obviously we're all rooting for the global economy to recover as quickly as possible. And uh, you know, having a, a, a normal life back, I think, is of paramount importance if we can get there as soon as possible. Thanks. Mr. Garth, hey. to ask you uh, only, only the last question. Uh, to ask you if how Sounders can look or will look to the Mexican market for the next transfer window. I don't know if there is someone, Mexican player, that uh, fills your eye, fills the eye of the Soul Sounders. We've been active in Mexico. You know, we, we acquired uh, Raul Ruiz Diaz uh, from uh, Morelia uh, a couple windows ago. Uh, you know, we have uh, all three DP spots filled right now, um, and we've deployed all of our TAM money. So. Uh, or most of it, I should say, not quite all of it. Um, so in, in uh, historically, at least the Mexican market's been you know, a really good place to look for high-end players, but usually fairly pricey, expensive players. So we'll have to see what the market looks like on, on the other side of COVID and how those teams and clubs are and that league is impacted. Um, you know, but I think, you know, right now, as I said, 
um, we really tried to, you know, deploy all our resources at the beginning of our season. And, um, you know, we're not going to have a ton of flexibility uh, going forward this season uh, with respect to our MLS roster. Thank you. Hey, Garth, it's Matt Pence. Um, I have a question from a reader, but I'm also a little bit curious myself. It's, uh, do you watch behind the scenes soccer shows like Sunderland Till I Die? And is it weird watching someone do your own job? Um, and then related, I wanted to ask both of you guys if you had any TV or streaming recommendations during the uh, the lockdown here. I know you've talked about The Last Dance a lot, Garth. Yeah, look, I have not seen uh, the Sunderland show. Uh, Alex Caulfield calls me, you know, once a week, if not more often, to tell me that I'm missing out on a on a wonderful thing. Uh, Matt, I have been deluged by Jerry Krause comments uh, since the advent of the last dance, and I would like to state for the group here in the record, I would like uh, Coach Metzer and his staff to come back next year. So uh, <laughs> just for the avoidance of any doubt, uh, uh, you know, it, you. Yes, it's weird to watch someone else do your job, and you know, Jerry is himself just a really interesting figure. And not to uh, he clearly did something right, uh, and he clearly, you know, wasn't maybe the most likable guy. So uh, and he's not here to defend himself, but uh, it certainly makes for some interesting conversations. I think with anybody who enjoys sports, you know, it, it is a really, really interesting character. Uh, and you, all the relationships, and I had actually probably will be my last comment on it, but uh, I had thought that that the Jerry Krause and Jordan relationship had deteriorated around the last two contracts where they paid at that time. The NBA did not have a salary cap uh, for for play, uh, teams retaining their own players, and so they want to pay in Jordan thirty million a year, which is still more than anyone's ever made in a season since then. In fact, they had to lock the players out to achieve uh, a better outcome perspective. <laughs> Uh, just shortly after, and I thought that was the end of the whole breakdown of the relationship. But you know, you go back and watch the last dance. Jordan hated them since '86 or '87. So uh, you know, the fact that they were able to coexist somehow for 12 years is, in some ways, uh, more amazing than anything else. Uh, and uh, recommendations, uh, Matt. Uh, I'm trying to catch up on Breaking Bad. It was like the one show that I heard about that I thought I might like, and you know, I've watched a couple of those uh, while we're in uh, quarantine. Awesome. Any from you, Coach? Yeah, there's a lot of good soccer matches on with Michelle Ludka on Q13. Uh, you know, there's been some really, really fantastic matches on. So I would do want to say that. Uh, Bodyguard, Netflix, Peaky Blinders, I mean, Jeopardy, why not watch Jeopardy? I mean, or read a book. You guys can read books. Matt, you have a pretty good book on my coffee table. So there you go. Thanks, guys. Coach, uh, how's it been uh, to relive all those great moments, success, uh, you know, every Saturday with all these games going and you interacting with uh, – Players like Brad Evans, like Sakwani, all of that. Look, Nico, you got you guys probably saw my tweet. I don't tweet I don't tweet that often. You know, I, I try and not do that too often unless it's something very important to me. But before the last game, the 09, the first game, when 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 Brad and Steve had all of those old guys on there, Ozzy, Montero, Jaqua, uh uh, Stephen King, uh, Evan Brown, Taylor. I mean, that was that was some of the best banter back and forth about that game, how they experienced that first game. I mean, I enjoyed the pregame there immensely. I, obviously, we watched the game up until three uh, nothing. You know, you know the outcome. It's you know that's a little bit different, but I loved that when all of those ex. Sounder players, James Riley. I mean, they all came on and they were having a blast. It, it was fun. Uh, co uh, Coach and Garth, I was just curious, um, in the event that this season uh, takes on some different form because of just, you know, condensed time frame, I was curious if there's anything uh, from what's been talked about that kind of interests you uh, that you would like to see. I asked uh, Stefan and uh, Christian about this yesterday. Just what kind of format would be kind of interesting uh, tournaments, uh, you know, going Western conference only just uh, anything that's uh, kind of caught your eye and just kind of chatting with everyone. 
Mickey, for me, I, I just want to do whatever it takes to play all, all the games. You know, I think that that's what gives the season integrity. Uh, I think that that's uh, something that we will, you know, really strive to do. Um, and, you know, that's what's you know most important to us as an organization. I, I, I would agree, Mickey. I, I think the integrity of this season, I mean, look, let's just say there, we don't play all the games and then there'll be an asterisk and whichever team comes out and wins MLS Cup this year always has to explain, well, we only played, you know, 28 games or 24 games and, you know, you'd have that little thing. If the schedule is such and we have X amount of games and everybody has preparation time and and it's a fair competition for all parties, then that's what I would advocate for. And then if a guy, if a team is crown champion and we only played 24 games, well, then there's still a chance in my eyes because everybody had a fair shot at it. Guys, we're, we're a little north of an hour, so if there's one or two follow-ups, I, th- I think if Brian and Garth are willing to uh, allow that, we, we can probably do that, but we should wrap up here pretty soon. Anything else from the group? Maybe one or two questions more. I actually uh, had a question uh, for Brian, I suppose, specifically. Um, one of the things that we've seen raised in, in Germany, especially as they're coming back, is that... Um, even with the safety protocols, there's still some spread of coronavirus going around. And we're, we've seen uh, teams, I think it's Mines uh, in particular, had a couple of positive tests after they reopened training. How much concern is there from you that uh, there simply isn't a safe way to, or there isn't a, a way to eliminate the risk of, of spread once you guys return to training? And how much of, of your thinking is just based in the belief that when you go back, it will be reasonably safe. I, I guess, how much concern around safety do you still have? Okay. That was lunch, by the way. It was good. You know, I'm still managing it with the, with the kids. Good. All right. Okay. I know you have kids at home, so I'm, I'm going to let you off the hooks easily. Uh, that's, a, that's a challenging question, though, Jeremiah, because, look, I mean, there, there's risk everywhere. Look, I try and go to the grocery store once every eight nine days okay but there's risk if i go outside i i i have my mask right here i i I, there there's going to be some risk in everything that we do and so how much risk is too much risk what is safe what is not all of those things that's it that's a really challenging and probably a personal choice I mean, it, 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 it's going to weigh on some people's minds. I mean, I might be a little bit more pragmatic than the next person, and you know, somebody else might be a little more sensitive. And I think we all have to come to grips with with you know our own thoughts. I don't think that okay. Let's just say we go back to training and we have some games, and you know, more people get the disease, which is probably likely to happen. Some of those people might not even know they have the disease because some people get it and they're asymptomatic. So I, I just don't know if we can really answer that question as a group. You have to answer it personally. And I would say that the, the protocols that I've seen so far for just the individual training, I, I think are good. Now, when things progress and we get a handle on some of the you know, vaccines or cures or, you know, God forbid, hopefully we can get some good news one of these days, then I think that will ease things up. In the meantime, I'm going to practice my social distancing. Again, we're going to lead by example. We're going to do what our local authorities tell us to do. And and, and that's how I'm looking at it. 